Welcome to the Coulter Bay meeting. My name is Rachel Collins with the National Park Service. Um, I will be facilitating the meeting tonight. Um, and we're just going to do a quick catch up on the logistics for anyone who might be joining late, didn't catch this the first time, and then we'll jump in. Um, we're here to share on this process. Um, we're in pre NEPA civic engagement. We're going to be talking about what the Coulter Bay Legacy Project is all about. Um, and how you can participate in this process. This will be a chance to learn about the project, ask any questions you might have so that you can be involved. If you have questions or if you have comments about this, you can put that in our portal. We'll be pushing that information for that link through in the announcements. Again, we want to introduce you to the process and to the project and share some background. I'm going to do a couple of logistics um, to get us going, and then we'll dive into the heart of this presentation. We are in Teams Live uh, this afternoon. Um, we are going to be taking questions throughout this presentation. So there is a Q&A button up in your top right hand corner. Go ahead and click that at any time. Go ahead, ask a question, pop it in there. We've got a team that's collecting in the background, organizing them by theme. We'll get to them at the end of the presentation after we go through uh, the information that we have to share. Also, if you're new to Teams Live, you can adjust your own sound in the lower left hand corner as well as turn on captioning for yourself in the lower right hand corner. We also have live captioning service available for this meeting tonight. We're going to push the link through to the live captioning um, in the announcements. You'll see that come through on your on your Q&A and in your chat box here in just a minute. So with those logistics out of the way and the tech checks all cleared, I will go ahead and turn it over to our superintendent, Chip Jenkins, to start into the presentation. Off to you, Chip. Hey, hey thanks, Rachel. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, as Rachel said, I'm Chip Jenkins. I'm the superintendent here at Grand Teton National Park. Uh, thank you, all of you, for being here tonight to learn more about where we are and to help us figure out where we need to go in the future for Coulter Bay. Uh, tonight is an opportunity for us to be able to share information with you to help you provide feedback and input um, as we are at the very beginning um, of this significant planning process. Um, uh, first, uh, it is important uh, to recognize that people have a long, long history, uh, a long legacy of being in what is now Grand Teton National Park and the area where Coulter Bay exists today. Uh, indigenous people have been on this landscape for at least 12,000 years. Um, they have been and they continue to be here, making a living, finding ways uh, to uh, enjoy and live off the landscape, as well as also spiritual renewal, just like the rest of us. The first Europeans uh, did not arrive here until the early 1800s. Um, kind of famously, John Coulter, uh, a, a member of the Lewis and Clark expedition, first visited Jackson Hole uh, just over 200 years ago in 1807. Uh, by the late 1800s, early 1900s, most who lived here saw that resource-based tourism, uh, in other words, hosting people to come and visit, enjoy the scenery, enjoy the wildlife, uh, uh, water, uh, uh, recreation, was not only uh, driving the local economy then, but was really the future for, uh, for this area. From the 1920s, the National Park Service uh, pursued an overall management strategy here to be able to try to disperse people across the landscape. Uh, the National Park Service were working to help people enjoy this place by spreading out and going to many different places. After World War II ended, there was a huge growth in the number of people who wanting to visit not only Grand Teton, but all the national parks across the country. And to ad address this increasing demand for visitation in the late 1940s and early 1950s, the National Park Service picked up planning for Grand Teton with both a draft management plan and conceptual plans for Coulter Bay. The draft management plan continued the philosophy that had started in the 1920s of looking to spread visitation out across the landscape by, amongst other things, having a two-tiered road system. The outer highway was identified as a high-speed route for people wanting to have a shorter, faster travel time. Uh, while the Inner Park Road was a place for a slower, more contemplative uh, park experience. 
uh, in the 1940s, the Park Service recognized that nodes of development were going to be needed to support more intensive visitation and recreation, um, places where there would be more infrastructure, where there would be parking, bathrooms, overnight lodging, camping, uh, in order to be able to host people as they were uh, moved around on this landscape. Uh, while most of the landscape had little or low intensity development um, to support uh, dispersed uh, recreation. By the late 40s and er early 1950s, uh, visitation uh, to national parks across the country had increased so much, uh, people were concerned that parks were, quote, being loved to death. It was actually the first time that that term was used was in the late 1950s. This led the National Park Service and Congress to create the Mission 66 program, which marked a, um, uh, a development and reimagining of national parks to address the increased use uh, in the post-World War II era. Thanks to the generosity of the Rockefeller family, Grand Teton was chosen as a pilot project for this Mission 66 program. Um, the, uh, 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 and, um, in the early 1950s, uh, uh, several projects at Grand Teton uh, came to be serving as pilots for the Mission 66 program, including Jackson Lake Lodge and Coulter Bay. Uh, construction actually began at Coulter Bay in the late 1950s, uh, and while the original pilot plan was never completed, uh, construction in what is contemporary Coulter Bay was largely completed in 1966. Uh, and in supporting visitors across the park, one of the purposeful parts of Mission 6 strategy was to create Coulter Bay, along with the Jackson Lake Lodge, as a primary destination uh, for overnight visitors. So the lo location of Coulter Bay is really nicely situated in the north part of the park for travelers moving between Yellowstone, Du Bois, and Jackson. Um, a sign in the visitor center at that time uh, above the information desk, it's actually in the lower right corner there. Uh, it says uh, in large letters, we can go anywhere from here. And that still applies to Coulter Bay today. However, the, the layout of the current layout of Coulter Bay was designed around the need for overnight visitors of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. For example, the arrival sequence is really aimed at meeting the needs of people who are coming to spend the night. When you drive into Coulter Bay, the one of the first things you come to is a faraway stop that provides access to the overnight accommodations of either going to the campgrounds or the lodging. The next step on is going to the grocery store and going to the laundrette. Um, and that was really built on the philosophy that once overnight visitors got settled in, in their uh, overnight accommodations at the campground or the lodging, they would then further explore Coulter Bay, find the visitor center and other recreational opportunities. And that worked really pretty well for people who were spending the night or multiple nights, as was the original intention in the 50s and 60s. So while the infrastructure and locations of visitor services, amenities, information, recreational opportunities have remained largely unchanged, um, a lot of other things have changed in the 75 years since Coulter Bay Village was originally planned and constructed. So for example, visitation has dramatically changed. Last summer, on an average day, there were about 2,500 overnight visitors each night in Coulter Bay. That's a lot of people. However, you compare that, there were uh, on average over 12,500 day visitors to Coulter Bay. That's five times as many day visitors were coming to Coulter Bay as overnight visitors. There have been changes in the ecosystem too. Um, uh, Coulter Bay, Grand Teton, and actually all of Jackson Hole is now fully occupied grizzly bear habitat. Uh, people now come from all over the world to be able to see and watch wildlife, including grizzly bears and wolves. Um, something that is relatively a new phenomenon in the last decade. Uh, we now recognize that people have lived on this landscape for thousands of years, and tribes continue to this day to have a vibrant and rich culture that is directly dependent upon this place, and we have an obligation to help them maintain their connections to the land. Coulter Bay has received little improvements during the last 60 to 70 years, Elements of the Mission 66 design remain intact today with the built environment designed and constructed with the natural topography. Structures are low-lying, set back from the roads, walkways allowing natural environment, 
um, to the degree that you can see the mountains over the grown up vegetation uh, and uh, 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 predominate in the view shed. An array of overnight accommodations continue to exist with tent and RV camping, a tent village in the cabins. Each summer since the mid 1970s, Grand Teton National Park has welcomed Native American artists at the Coulter Bay Visitor Center to share their traditional and contemporary art with park visitors. Participating artists demonstrate and share the cultural traditions of their tribes through art forms such as painting, weaving, pottery, beadwork, and musical instruments. Interestingly enough, the uh, original plan for Coulter Bay was actually never fully constructed, and you can feel that when you first arrive at the park by how um, the buildings are oriented around this uh, parking plaza. Originally, there were plans for a bowling alley, a dance hall, other night, uh, other overnight uh, focused activities, um, uh, which is, you know, why kind of when you when you get in there by the uh, grocery store and the laundrette, um, it feels uh, like there's a lot of parking, um, uh, but kind of has a sense of being unfinished. Increasing visitation, changing visitor and employee needs um, are uh, 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 commitments that we need to honor with the tribes, uh, as well as the changing ecosystem and, and uh, significantly aging infrastructure highlight an opportunity for us to be able to plan for the next generation of Cultured Bay. Um, and that's part of the primary goal of this planning effort that we want to address is uh, not just how are we trying to meet the needs today, but how do we try to be able to adapt and be flexible uh, moving into the future? And we need your help for that. Today, Coulter Bay remains one of the most visited areas in Green Teton. We'll learn about it, a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, as it's true for the entire park, day users, people who spend the night outside the park, now make up the vast majority of park visitors. While we still provide high quality overnight experiences, places for people to camp, people to stay in a variety of different lodging, um, uh, to be able to be in the backcountry. As I said, about 2,500 people spend the night in Coulter Bay, where we welcome over 12,500 people uh, as day visitors to the, to the place. This trend will not only continue, but it is likely to grow as more overnight accommodations continue to be built and operated throughout the greater Yellowstone ecosystem in Jackson, Du Bois, over in Idaho, and areas beyond. With these changes in the ecosystem, both ecological and societal, how visitors recreate are going to continue to change. Um, as we mentioned, we have ongoing grizzly bear and wolf recovery that has created outstanding opportunities to be able to view wildlife that did not exist when Coulter Bay was originally planned. The vast majority of visiting Grand Teton and Coulter Bay spend the night someplace else and drive into and out of the park each day. Over the last five plus years, we've seen large increases in the number of people on trails seeking opportunities to get out of their vehicles and to be able to go for a walk or a hike. Expectations that developed areas in the park are much more pedestrian, walker friendly, and bike friendly too. Um, uh, people really are looking to be able to rely less on driving around and to be able to walk and bike. And Coulter Bay is not really set up to be able to support that. And as we mentioned, tribes continue to express an interest in having the ability to gather, a place where they can enjoy their homelands, teach their young, and use their, uh, their traditional cultural practices. And we need to be able to be better at supporting uh, those needs. So why are we here now? Um, we're talking a bit about that. The overall goal for this planning effort is to build on the positive legacy of work done before to continue to have Coulter Bay as a primary place to support high quality resource-based recreation, including high quality overnight stays, <clears throat> high quality day visitors, sustainable ecosystem processes, as well as supporting tribes in their work to maintain their culture. With the increase in day users, Coulter Bay is not only able to meet the needs of today, but we need them to meet future visitor needs. The sense of arrival at Coulter Bay is frankly underwhelming and the sequence of arrival at various places, services, visitor center and recreational opportunities is flat out confusing. The current layout 
results in a feeling of disconnection between the experiences. Coulter Bay is actually a really big area, so people wind up driving to each location rather than uh, being encouraged to get out of their vehicle if they want and to be able to walk around. And, um, barriers exist to um, accessing the lake uh, as well as also just being able to walk or, or, or ride your bike around simply because it's kind of confusing. Other issues include limited views, outdated visitor uh, facilities, in inadequate workspaces for uh, park employees and volunteers that are needed to be able to operate this place. Uh, Coulter Bay presents multiple opportunities too, while at the same time uh, uh, it can feel um, uh, busy in some places, the existing areas of parking are actually not fully utilized. Uh, the area is uh, um, uh, large uh, that allows for opportunities to be able to provide uh, much more accessible recreational opportunities, um, as well as I mentioned, places that we might be able to explore working with tribes for conti uh, continued cultural practices. Um, we need to understand what's needed over the next 50 years to keep Coulter Bay relevant and to meet people's needs. Um, how do we enhance this resource-based visitor experience? What is it that we need to do to help uh, visitors find uh, the range of high quality uh, recreational opportunities that you're interested in doing there? Um, we are uh, uh, need your help in order to be able to identify those things that will help us make this place better. So we are, uh, let's get it, we're going to dig in a bit more here um, into a few things, including more on the preliminary planning process, the underlying things that we have learned over the last few, few years that are helping to inform our thinking, we want to share with you so that it can help inform your thinking. So I'm going to turn this over to Amanda, who is leading this planning effort for us. So Amanda, will you take it away? Amanda, can you try hitting your mute button one more time? It might not have stuck, so just check it in the tech. Thank you. Thank you. That's better. Thank um, you. Thanks, Chip. Over the last few months, the planning team here at Grand Teton has identified several project objectives uh, to guide this planning effort. Uh, regionally, Coulter Bay is nicely situated as a center for visitors to take a break from traveling between Yellowstone and Jackson or Dubois. Uh, therefore, an overarching objective is to retain Coulter Bay as a key destination for a diverse range of users and provide high quality experiences. Uh, Coulter Bay is al already a large development with adequate space for infrastructure and services to accommodate commercial tour buses and other large groups uh, looking to recreate in the park. So an, an objective here is to accommodate those needs in this location. Uh, Grand Teton would like to improve overall visitor experience by, as Chip mentioned, cultivating a sense of arrival to Coulter Bay, where visitors can intuitively know when they've arrived, intuitively move between different locations within the developed area via pedestrian, bike, or other micromobility methods. And by micromobility, I'm talking about rollerblades, skateboards, or whatever uh, we see coming out into the future in the next 50 plus years. Um, we know Coulter Bay has been and continues to be important to tribes and is situated within their ancestral homelands of the Jackson Hole Valley. We are interested in supporting continued connection with the land by creating meaningful opportunities and physical spaces where tribes can continue traditional cultural practices, engage in tribal business enterprise, and provide education to visitors about tribal culture. Um, a wide range of high quality year round uh, land and water based recreation opportunities for visitors are already present at Coulter Bay and an objective will be to improve and if appropriate, expand recreation within an approximate one mile radius of the main developed area. Any new development at Coulter Bay should maintain a sense of scale in which the natural environment, including the mountains and lakes, are primary features. Additionally, new infrastructure, if, if determined needed, uh, would be Mission 66 compatible while supporting day and overnight visitor needs for the next 50 plus years. Um, 
With this planning effort, we intend to integrate management of terrestrial, aquatic, and cultural resources into the uh, Culture Bay uh, future uh, while prioritizing the needs of the day and overnight visitors within the developed area. We'll also continue to provide availability to a wide array of overnight accommodation types without change to the overnight visitor capacity. So those are the objectives uh, we're looking at accomplishing here. Um, so then uh, this slide shows a couple of the concepts uh, that we've presented to folks and we do uh, encourage you to take a look at the newsletter provided at the NPS Planning Environment and Public Comment website, also called the Pepsi website. Um, within that newsletter is a range of high level planning concepts. Uh, the planning concepts provide different conceptualizations, several conceptualizations um, in which we considered how to enhance a sense of arrival at Coulter Bay, the order of locations, of visitor services, amenities, education, information, recreation, all those different functional uses at Coulter Bay and, and where they're situated on the landscape. We're also, we also looked at ways to address congestion seen today with uh, vehicular corridors, bisecting parking areas and walkways. So those were some considerations we put into thinking through these concepts. The concepts consider uh, the separation of roads from parking areas, creating more pedestrian friendly experiences, uh, ideas on ways to minimize barriers between amenities, services, water and recreation um, created by slopes, roads or other features were also considered. A major piece of this planning effort is to address um, is to address the day use and how these visitors use and experience the core area of Coulter Bay. Uh, sorry about that. Um, the core area of Coulter Bay. Uh, this is why the, the concepts focus on that core area. Um, however, master planning effort does encompass all of Coulter Bay, and so some of the surrounding areas are included. Comments, inclu comments regarding issues and opportunities in these areas are definitely welcome and we encourage them. Uh, information on how to comment on these concepts or other uh, issues and opportunities important to you will be provided. Uh, at the end of this presentation. Um, so I, I do want to say uh, we have been thinking about this for a while and we have been gathering information. Park staff have been gathering data about how visitors are currently using Coulter Bay. And so I want to um, send you over to Dr. Jen Newton, Park Social Scientist, and she's going to present uh, what we've learned so far on this topic. Jen? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, and thank you so much for the opportunity to talk a little bit about the social science at Culture Bay. Um, as Amanda mentioned, I am Jen Newton, the social scientist here in the park. Um, and before I get into details, I just want to talk a little bit about Culture Bay in the context of Grand Teton National Park. And so overall, Grand Teton on peak summer days, we can see about 25,000 visitors a day. Um, and as Chip had mentioned earlier in the presentation, Culture Bay can see about 12,500 visitors in a day that comes in. So that means that approximately half of our daily visitation to the park stops within Culture Bay each day. Um, and so that's really interesting to think about that in the entire context of Grand Teton and how people are moving throughout our system. Additionally, when we look at things in a park wide scale, um, we have done studies that show that we really don't have a dominant travel pattern within Grand Teton National Park. And what I mean by that is that visitors aren't necessarily going from point A to point B. They're traveling throughout the park in this auto touring style that's really punctuated by many stops um, with no particular pattern. So folks might go through the entrance gate, they stop at an overlook, they may stop at the park side, stop at a trailhead, at a visitor center. They're making these multiple stops with no dominant travel pattern. One of the stops that a lot of visitors do make is within Coulter Bay. It's one of our most popular spot, spots within the park. Additionally, kind of mirroring that park wide pattern, there's no dominant travel pattern within Coulter Bay either. As mentioned previously, there's many different locations within the Coulter Bay area that visitors can go to. 
Top visited locations within Coulter Bay include the visitor center, the general store, the swim beach area, marina, and the trail system. But whenever we survey visitors and look at their travel behaviors within that Coulter Bay area, there's really no dominant travel pattern to the order in which folks are visiting these different locations within Coulter Bay. Additionally, the graph on the left here shows parking lot vehicle counts that were conducted in 2021. That red line near the top indicates the total number of available parking space in Coulter Bay, which is around 525 spaces. This excludes the campground. This is just the area within the day use area. While the blue line within this graph indicates the average number of vehicles that are parked in Coulter Bay in July or during our peak season in 2021. And as you can see, um, we're never quite or near um, that, that level of parking availability that is there. Um, on average, during peak, we're about two thirds full of what could possibly be of the available parking within these lots. We did find that some lots within Coulter Bay do fill. So for example, Swim Beach will sometimes fill. However, there's still ample parking for folks to go to different areas within the Coulter Bay area um, and go on. Additionally, in preparation for this effort, we did conduct a visitor use and experience study in Coulter Bay, where we conducted in-person interviews with more than 900 visitors to Coulter Bay. And what we found was that the majority of visitors were day visitors. About 65% um, of folks who were visiting Culture Bay were visiting there um, during the day, um, just for the day, not staying overnight in the lodging or in the campground at Culture Bay. Additionally, we found that the majority, or 67% of visitors, were also first time visitors to Culture Bay. And so they had never been to this area of the park before, and it was their first time experiencing Culture Bay. We also found which was mentioned before, um, that many, um, the vast majority, 84%, arrived via private vehicle. Um, and so once again, kind of that auditorium style park wide and how folks are visiting Coulter Bay as well, they are coming in their private vehicle. 10% of those were self-reported as recreational vehicles. Additionally, folks also reported 60% um, that they get to places within Coulter Bay via their personal vehicle. That might be in addition to walking and other things as well, but that really does show us that folks are going from place to place within Coulter Bay via their personal vehicle. Um, respondents to our survey also self-reported that their median stay was about three hours within the park, and the top five uh, reported activities included hiking, photography, scenic driving, visiting a visitor center, and wildlife viewing. And these numbers are very similar to park-wide studies that we have done whenever we sample folks all over the park. Um, so very similar of those activities that they're doing at Culture Bay, folks are doing elsewhere in the park as well. There's a ton of information about Culture Bay, and I'm sure I could probably fill the rest of the evening just talking and um, about Culture Bay in that study, but we do have the entire report available for you um, at go.nps.gov backslash Teton VUE. And so that full report for the Culture Bay Visitor Use and Experience Study can be found there. Additionally, one other thing we look at um, in a lot of our social science studies are motivations. And really that's getting that why people are visiting certain areas within the park. And so this graph here shows results from studies that were conducted in Culture Bay, that same visitor use and experience study I mentioned on the previous slide, um, and also a study that was done in 2022 at a park-wide scale. So we took a random sample of visitors on a park-wide scale and asked them about their motivations and activities. And really not surprisingly, viewing scenery and wildlife tend to rate really high in terms of motivations for visiting Grand Teton National Park as well as Coulter Bay. Spending time with friends and family and the opportunity to relax also rank very high for Coulter Bay and as park-wide motivations. And so really these key motivations that of why people are coming and there are important reasons of why they want to come to Grand Teton National Park are also mirrored in why people want to go to Coulter Bay.
Additionally, as we think about Coulter Bay, we'll continue to think about how it fits into the broader context of Grand Teton and the recreational opportunities that we're providing on a park wide scale. Some of you might be familiar that we're underway um, with learning about issues and opportunities on this park wide scale. We had a public comment period earlier this year, late summer and early autumn. And really, we know Coulter Bay is not an island. And as we continue, um, to engage with this effort and also park wide scale efforts, we will continue to consider how Coulter Bay fits into these broader contexts, both park wide and regionally as the efforts move forward. And in addition to social science, we're also conducting physical science research. And I'm gonna pass along to Simeon Kasky, our branch chief of physical sciences to talk in more detail about that. Thank you so much, Jen. As Chip mentioned earlier, Coulter Bay has experienced changes in ecosystem conditions since its current layout was planned and built. And one of our charges as park staff is to actively incorporate that past and the future projected environmental change into this very planning effort. And some of those examples of ecosystem changes that we're seeing and will continue to see are related to climate change and how it's impacting precipitation and hydrology and how that could affect the water levels in Jackson Lake and the Coulter Bay area. We're also now, as Chip mentioned earlier, seeing fully occupied grizzly habitat and wolves have become a significant part of the ecosystem again since Coulter Bay was planned and built. Additionally, as uh, driven by some of these reasons, wildlife viewing nearby has grown substantially in recent years and has become much more of a prominent activity in this area. And one of the primary as a focus for this planning effort is the water and lake levels, as I mentioned earlier. And specifically, park staff and researchers are assessing effects on Jackson Lake and Coulter Bay that may come with the changing climate, and also the associated changes in downstream water use and management and how that drives water levels. Some of the changes in climate that are expected to alter annual patterns of precip in the snowpack over the century. And current projections suggest that while we may not see that much difference in total annual precipitation, the snowpack is expected to decrease with seasonal warming and rain is expected to increase. And these changes obviously have the potential to impact how water is stored and released from Jackson Lake. And some of the preliminary analysis of current climate projections indicate that a significant reduction in access at Coulter Bay is not expected, but we're working on further analysis to incorporate uh, projected changes in downstream drought that water demand and the management of this complex water delivery system, which could alter these project projections. So in summary, as part of the planning process, we are paying very close attention to the hydrology. And while it might, may not affect water coming into the lake, it may very well affect water being drawn out of the lake. Back to you, Chip. Thanks, Simeon. So we're getting we're getting close to the end here, folks, for and we'll when we'll be able to take questions. Uh, I just want to say Grand Teton National Park needs your help. Um, and we need help from everyone that has an interest in this park. We invite you and everyone to learn more about the opportunities and challenges this project is trying to address. Um, you can start by reviewing the draft planning concepts and share your back, uh, your feedback. So in just a minute here, uh, the next slide that we're going to put up, uh, we'll have a QR code and a URL. Um, you can use either one of them that will take you to uh, the planning page where these draft uh, concepts can be found and where you can, uh, with a click of a button, uh, be able to input your thoughts, ideas, and concerns. Um, we'll keep that web page up for a bit as we go through questions, so you can use either the QR code or the URL. Um, we encourage you to, uh, uh, to do that, as well as to share it with family and friends who may be um, interested, because it's your help that will directly inform this planning work. Um, and this work, in turn, will guide the management of Coulter Bay for the next 50 plus years. So this means that the work will affect how we preserve the water, water quality, preserve the wildlife, preserve the environment, while also providing really great visitor experiences for generations to come. So thank you for taking the time to be with us. 
And I'll kick it over to you, Rachel, to give some more technical information there and be able to set us up for questions. Thank you, Chip. I am. I'm going to set us up for the Q&A. So um, that is the end of our presentation, but I have been watching questions come in and I know folks are curious. And again, the purpose of this Q&A period is we want to make sure that folks have the information that they need to provide really quality feedback, quality comments. And so if you have any questions about this information, about this process, uh, about the trajectory that we're on with this planning effort, please go ahead um, and start populating those into the Q&A. I do want to remind folks um, that we are not taking comments during this meeting because we have a separate portal set up for that. So if you have thoughts or comments or feedback, um, please go ahead and use the parkplanning.nps.gov slash Coulter Bay Legacy URL that is on your screen. We'll also drop that into the chat uh, for folks to be able to put your comments there. Um, we are going to try to stay focused on the topic at hand this evening um, to be talking about Coulter Bay and the future of Coulter Bay in this process. Uh, and so we're going to be focusing uh, our time on those questions uh, this evening. Um, so what we are going to do is give folks uh, about two minutes. Um, if you need a chance to stretch, refill your cup of tea, um, or even just take a break to like think about your question and type it in while you're not also listening to the presentation, we'll take about two minutes uh, for folks to go ahead and open up that question pod to see if they've got questions. We're going to sort them kind of by topic and by theme. We've got some similar questions coming in um, in the background, and we'll be uh, back in just about two minutes here to start walking our way through your questions and the answers from the park staff. All right, for anybody who may be tuning in, we're just taking a minute here to let people put questions in. So thanks, folks. Okie doke, we've got a pretty solid list. So let's go ahead uh, and get started into those. Chip, first question is coming your direction. Um, we had someone who is curious about day and overnight. We've heard a lot of discussion about day users on this presentation. Will, uh, will the overnight visitor experience also be considered in this planning effort? Uh, yes, the overnight experience is considered part of the, uh, you know, part of this planning experience. I mean, what we recognize is that Coulter Bay is a um, holistic, multi-dimensional place. Um, uh, what I would, what I would say is, is that part of the um, part of the experiences that we have at Coulter Bay are uh, because the campgrounds and the lodging are managed under the concession contracts. Uh, there may be, um, uh, depending upon what the topics are that people want to address, there may be things that can be addressed in the nearer term um, uh, through the concession contract. Other things may may need a, a longer lead time to do that. Um, also, though, having said that, is um, the the overnight capacity of the park, the number of camp campgrounds, campsites, and hotel rooms um, was set in the Grand Teton National Park Master Plan in 1976. Um, that number was capped, 
and we are not looking at revisiting that number. Um, rather, we look at uh, continuing to work with uh, local communities and private industry to uh, outside of the park to be meeting that um, increasing demand. Thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, Amanda, I'm coming over to you next. Um, there was a question about if we're going to be looking at winter use in Coulter Bay as a part of this process and project. Thanks, Rachel. Um, yes, winter recreation is definitely a consideration within the planning effort. Uh, currently, overnight users camp in the parking area uh, and have access to a bathroom. Uh, so we really want to hear from folks about um, what issues and opportunities are, are, are associated with your winter recreation based experiences at Coulter Bay? Certainly interested in both day and overnight users. And uh, so please keep those comments coming. Thanks, Rachel. OK, great. Um, I'm going to uh, continue to go through comments here. And I think that another good thing to think about is, you know, to think about like, what do you want to see? We also really want to hear from folks from y'all about what you're seeing, what you're observing, and and what you want to see in this process. Okay, I'm going to head back over to Chip. This one's for you. Um, will additional boat slips be added to the marina or additional non-motorized boat rental? So I think um, uh, I think uh, ideas, uh, I thoughts, ideas, uh, concerns that people have about water-based recreation and uh, what you see as um, how you would like that water-based recreation and what you need to have is exactly the kind of comments and feedback that we need people to provide to us. So that's, uh, that, that is um, well within the scope of, uh, we, we, need your, we need your thoughts and ideas on that. Okay, great. Um, and then seeing um, another one come in, and I think you've already addressed this, Chip, but I'm just going to make sure that we close the loop on it, um, that there was another question about adding campground or RV loops at Coulter Bay, and I think you addressed this previously, but can you just circle back on it to close the loop on it? Yep, we are, uh, we, we are um, because uh, overnight accommodations were capped in the 1976 uh, general uh, management plan. We are not looking at reopening that decision. And uh, 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 we are open to looking at changes that may need to be done in, in order to be able to um, improve the quality of the experience, though. Okay. Thank Great. you. Excellent. Okie doke. Um, and then I think maybe I'm going to toss this one to Amanda, but feel free to pass it along to somebody else as we had a question about uh, what's the general timeline look like? We're in this comment period now. What comes next? Um, what does this project look like? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so I, I want to emphasize uh, these are high level planning concepts. These are ideas only. Um, so no decisions have been made. That's why we are um, here today talking about these ideas. Um, so following uh, the civic engagement period, this public engagement period on these ideas, uh, we will take this information and move toward developing uh, some more refined concepts, if not alternatives, that we would then take into the NEPA process and analyze more fully, uh, again, with your input. Uh, we anticipate at this point in time that we will be coming back to you in the spring or early summer uh, when more folks are in Coulter Bay, using Coulter Bay, uh, with these refined concepts or alternatives. Um, and then, uh, we would anticipate having the, the the overall process completed by the following spring 2025. Um, so that's that's the timeline we're on right now. That does look at um, analyzing and public feedback on alternatives and a plan uh, over the following year, starting spring 2024, ending in spring 2025. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, okay, we have another question back to Chip about campgrounds. 
Um, there was a question about if this plan is also going to consider any improvements to existing campgrounds or the RV park, such as updated bathrooms, repairing roads, resizing RV sites. Um, have we thought about that? What are kind of what's on the table for that and what do we want to learn about? Yeah, again, I think that if people have thoughts and ideas about um, how to improve the uh, overnight experience, uh, including um, in campgrounds, we welcome hearing those. Um, I think, again, it's just important to realize there, there are some things that we will be able to implement through the um, upcoming concession contract or things that we that may take longer uh, to be able to implement. Um, but we uh, now is a great time uh, in order to be able to um, uh, to to do that. Meaning provide your thoughts and ideas about what's needed. Great. OK. Thanks. Uh, Amanda, back to you. You're popular on this meeting tonight. Um, we uh, had a question about laundry and showers and campgrounds. So we have in the plans some lines about laundry and showers integrated into the campground. Does this mean we're going to close the other shower house and only have showers in the campgrounds? You want to talk a little bit more about the state of the concepts and kind of what we know and what we're still exploring? Yeah, certainly. Thanks, Rachel. Um, so the concepts, as I, as I said a moment ago, these are high level ideas. And so in those concepts that show laundry shower being in the campgrounds, uh, yes, those are ideas. It would relocate that function fully to the campground and out of the core area so that th those functions would no longer be in the core area with following those ideas. Um, if you do have ideas on how this could impact how you use Coulter Bay or suggestions on how this idea could work or why it wouldn't work, um, we definitely would want that feedback as well. I, I hope that helps clarify uh, the concepts and, and some of the ideas in there. Okie doke, Amanda, and don't go too far because I see a couple other that have your name on them, so I'm going to be coming right back your way. Um, it looks like um, we have a question about non-motorized watercraft launches. Um, so if we create a non-motorized watercraft launch at the swim beach, can it be wide enough for a vehicle towing like a multi-boat kayak canoe trailer type of thing? Um, or are we just lock looking for like hand carries down there like we have at String Lake? Another chance to kind of say like, what have we currently thought about? What are we still curious about when it comes to boat launches? Okay, great. Yeah. Um Appreciate somebody really dug into the concepts. Nice work. Uh, yeah, so this is one idea we were kind of playing around with, which is a non motorized watercraft access ramp only in Coulter Bay. Um, what it could accommodate, uh, uses it could accommodate, um, and how it would be designed is to be determined. And uh, so while we've played with this idea a little and put it in, in one of the concepts as an idea, um, knowing how it would function best is feedback we would need from its users and that would be you so feedback from you very important help us understand um, if we did pursue an idea like this how uh, non-motorized watercraft uh, ramp would best function uh, would it be hand launch only uh, would it uh, you know carrying your boat to the water or would it be um, best to have a, a vehicle uh, back down to the the water um so yeah please provide your feedback on that great i'm gonna have one more for you amanda stick around for just a minute um and we also had a question about accessibility and that some of the current um restrooms and boat rental areas are challenging for people who use mobil mobility devices and i'm paraphrasing a little bit um so can you let us know for any kind of new facilities, I think this question is specifically about restrooms, but I think people might be curious about other facilities in general. Kind of how are we thinking about accessibility to facilities like boat ramps, like launches, as we approach kind of the future of Coulter Bay? And how are we thinking about that issue as we approach this project? Yeah. Um super important and something we're pretty excited about is the potential for accessibility not only to the facilities and moving around the area but to the recreational opportunities that are out there uh certainly an objective of this plan uh and so um 
that that comment is a fantastic comment. It's hard to get to that restroom and we would appreciate uh, anything you're willing to expand upon as far as other challenges to accessibility in Coulter Bay, whether it's facilities, whether it's sidewalks, crossings, um, or simply uh, recreational opportunities. You know, what would you like to see uh, to make things more accessible, whether it's water or um, trails or other things that I can't even think of right now. So um, please provide that feedback. Hey, Rachel. Yeah. Yeah, let me uh, let me add a, uh, elaborate too on a, a Amanda's answer, right? Which all, all of which is correct. But I think um, uh, what I would in, what I what I think what I hope people um, would in part take away from this is to stay, take two steps back and think about um, when you. Uh, when Coulter Bay was originally created and you arrived and you were driving in, um, there was essentially no vegetation and you could see the lake and you could see the mountains and people were encouraged, uh, felt like they were encouraged to go down to the waterfront. The way things exist today is when you arrive, you can't see the lake in part because of vegetation, in part because of buildings. Um, and um, Arguably, it may not be the most welcoming place to be right down along the lake. And I think one of the things uh, I think one of the things that we are curious about what people think is um, making the um, lakeshore uh, more um, accessible and more attractive for uh, a wider range of people to be able to come and spend time along. And um, if that if that's a bad idea, why? If it's a good idea, why? And if it's a good idea, what might be, what might you see that is needed to be able to do that? Thanks, Amanda. Okay, uh, I'm gonna pop over um, to our park social scientist, Dr. Jen Newton, for a question about visitation statistics, her favorite topic. Um, Jen. We have someone who is curious about the increased visitation. Has it continuously increased at the same rate over time? Has there been a big jump since 2020 or maybe another point in time? Uh, related to this, what level of visitation are we planning for? 13,000, 20,000? What have you been seeing when you look at visitation statistics and what do you see in the future? Yeah, great, great question. Um, and so what we find is that Overall, our visitation trend uh, in Grand Teton National Park is increasing. Um, and great question about 2020. Like, I think a lot of folks know that was a big year for a lot of national parks. Um, and actually, our record year um, was 2021. Um, but really, for us, we were kind of hovering around, um, you know, 2.6, 2.8 million recreation visits. And actually in 2015, we got this bump that put us over 3 million recreation visits. And since that time, we've kind of been hanging around in that upper upper zone from about 2015. Um, and there's ebbs and flows from year to year. Like I said, 2021 was really a big year for us. The next previous busiest year was 2018. But even that over, aside from just overall numbers and how visitation functions in the park of levels of use, we're also seeing just changes in how people are using the park or when they're coming. And so for a great example, this year we found um, in 2020 and this year alone, um, we actually had September was a busier month for us in terms of recreation visits than June, right? And so really that tells us that kind of visitation patterns are also changing. It's not just about the levels, um, but how the patterns are, are moving throughout the park. Chip also mentioned early in the presentation that we're seeing that more and more folks are recreating on our trail systems. And so that proportion of recreation visits that kind of ebbs and flows has been a little bit higher since 2015 that proportion of folks who are using the trail systems is actually greater. It doesn't necessarily exactly mirror the number of recreation visits that we see in the park. And so truly, I wish I did have a crystal ball of what the next thing will bring. Um, it is hard to predict things like pandemics or last year with the Yellowstone floods or things like that. Um, but I think what we're really aiming for is to be flexible or to really understand surveys and through public comment periods like this, or what are those important key experiences at Coulter Bay, and how can we pr pr best provide that opportunity for folks into the future? Okay, thank you, Jen. 
Uh, we have a question I'm going to um, hand over to uh, Simeon related to the marina. There's a question that we had about, will there be a consideration to expand the marina to include dredging the channel deeper out to the lake or the ability to provide water in the marina when the lake is at lower levels? So how are we kind of thinking about those issues? Yeah, that's a great question. One we talked about uh, as a part of this planning effort. And at this time, we are not considering uh, dredging the channel as part of the alternatives. And part of the reason for that is because when you look at the bathymetry of the of the lake at that location, it would require uh, a Herculean effort of dredging almost a mile up to the deeper portions of the lake and could be tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of cubic yards of material and uh, slope instabilities and, and would be, a, like I said, a Herculean effort in of itself. And kind of building off of that question too, one of the uh, things we dismissed from incorporating into this planning effort would be uh, considering a marina at a different location. Uh, and the park it may consider improvements at Leaks Marina uh, to ensure day users can access Jackson Lake, uh, but at this time not considering different locations or dredging the, the channel to improve access during lower lake levels. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chip, there's another couple uh, that are coming in that I think would be great ones for you, so I'm going to head over your direction next. Um, someone, we have someone joining us who has been visiting Coulter Bay for 50 years. It's amazing. It's oh. so great. Um, oh. uh, they're, they're concerned that all of these improvements might mean that we're raising prices. What does this mean uh -huh. for future visits to Coulter Bay? Yeah, uh, you know, it is, uh, it is certainly not an objective to raise prices or to make a visit more. Actually, we, we do want to continue to provide um, a range of uh, visitor experiences so that people of all different means have, a, have an ability to um, visit and enjoy this place. <clears throat> we also do implement the laws, regulations, and policies that Congress and the administration provides for us, uh, the, the policy direction that is given to us. And um, the, the, the per current policy environment is, uh, is that concessions are allowed to be able to uh, charge uh, market rates that are comparable to uh, that of uh, private industry in the surrounding surrounding communities. And so no doubt over the last 50 years, you have seen uh, prices go up, whether that is a price for a tank of gas or a price for a cup of coffee or a uh, price for a, a, a place to spend the night. Um, uh, but that is, um, we are mindful in terms of the, <clears throat> we want to provide a range of experiences. We are not intentionally looking to be able to uh, change the cost of a visit. Okie doke. Um, another one for you. Uh, we, someone's really excited to see improvements that we're making to biking and walking needs because um, these were mentioned but weren't really fully developed in the legacy plan. Do we have any more information about how we're thinking about biking and walking? Or I'll add to the question, what are we curious about when it comes to biking and walking in Coulter Bay? Yeah, I think uh, so. I think you know what what you are seeing in the in the documents is those are very conceptual concepts, right? Um, they are not necessarily where uh, multi-use paths are or where buildings are they are uh they are much uh much more conceptual than that so uh we welcome and need uh your thoughts and ideas about what are the things that would make uh biking and walking uh more attractive and easier uh, uh in culture bay um, that's we, we need your creativity, your experience, and your thoughts about that. So, pl please provide them. Whether you want to write those down or even print out a map and mark it up. Me? Okay, I've got one more for you. Um, sure so we've got a question about 
if the NPS management team is seeking to ensure the stability, integrity, and beauty of the ecosystem, including wildlife, or the vi visitors the biggest desire for the new project. So we've talked a bunch about visitors. What's our what are our ecosystem goals and our um, and our wildlife and um, vegetation goals for this project? Sure. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. We are. Uh, it is uh, underlying. It's foundational for this and all of our other planning efforts in terms of uh, working to make sure that we have uh, uh, sustainable. Uh, 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 sustainable components of the ecosystem going forward. As uh, Simeon mentioned, you know we're we're very very fortunate um, in in some uh, important measures. The health of the ecosystem has actually um, improved over the last several decades. We now live in fully occupied grizzly bear habitat. There are wolves on the landscape. We have a. Uh, 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 um, uh, bald eagles and peregrine falcons and um, uh, uh, healthy ungulate populations. Uh, and so uh, we uh, absolutely want to be able to uh, maintain uh, maintain those. Part of the challenge for us, of course, is going to be what are the changes of, as a result of a changing climate um, going forward? And um, I think we need, we welcome your ideas about uh, where there uh, might be uh, issues or concerns, and your thoughts and ideas about how we ought to uh, how we ought to address those. That's a key part of what this planning process is. Okie doke. Uh, we've got another one coming in that I think would be um, helpful for Amanda to address. So I'm going to come your way, Amanda. Um, we had a question about will the Rockefeller cabins remain as is as are. Yeah, uh, so at this time, yes, they would, as a matter of fact, just plain yes. Uh, we are not expecting any major changes, changes to accommodations uh, in, in our uh, overnight accommodation areas. Uh, we do want to maintain the historic lodging areas to the greatest extent possible. Um, this is a cultural landscape, and so that would be a, an objective would be to maintain those. Okay, great. Um, and uh, I think there's another question that we have about parking. Uh, and so we see that there's boater parking and camper parking that sometimes happen in some of the similar locations. Um, and some are paying for campsites um, and, and then they're using other parking spaces. So can we just, I think like more generally than this specific question, can maybe you and Jen both talk a little bit about how we're thinking about how much parking we have and how we're allocating it or what some of the ideas we're thinking about and what some of the feedback is that we want about which parking for who and where. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to let Jen take a lot of this uh, because she has been really looking into how visitors are using parking out there uh, at Coulter Bay and studying that. Um, at this time, uh, all concepts maintain that existing level of parking. Uh, we do need feedback on, you know, do we have parking in the right places? And obviously that may change depending on how we move functions around, if we move functions around. Um, but uh, I think I'll, I'll give Jen a chance here to kind of ex ex extend that answer a bit. Wonderful. Yeah, thank you, Amanda and Rachel. Um, so in 2021, we did as part of those visitor surveys, we also did very detailed parking lot studies. Um, and so really understanding how many large vehicles, how many vehicles with trailers, how many trailers without a vehicle attached that were there, how many standard size vehicles or motorcycles. And so really wanted to understand the, the current composition of parking within Coulter Bay um, and understand that. And as Amanda said, um, no plan to dramatically reduce any of that composition of parking. Um, but if there is something we're missing or there is a need that, um, you know, we, we didn't quite get at or that maybe wasn't met, um, you know, we, we certainly want to hear from you, particularly in that that comment area. And so, um, you know, that's the wonderful thing about about opportunities like this is that if we missed something or there was something um, in that particular year, things like that, that maybe um, there is a, a bigger demand there or things like that. Like we, we certainly want to hear that and, and how that could help um, provide additional opportunities to folks or, or help improve that experience within Coulter Bay. Okay, uh, great. I 
am seeing another question about wildlife. So I think I'm going to pass that over to Simeon. Um, and it looks like we have a question about protecting wildlife. Chip touched on this a little bit, but I think we can touch on it a little bit more. Protecting wildlife doesn't seem to be included in our objectives, but there might be concerns about nesting birds, waterfowl, toads, other amphibians, beavers, foxes, um, and also thoughts about water quality, air quality um, as use grows. Um, vehicle wildlife collisions. I think there's like a just a whole bunch of um, different things that are a part of that. So could you tell us to us a little bit about how we start to think about some of those resources when we start to think about this planning effort and how we're going to continue to hold them in mind as we go forward? Definitely. Yeah, and thank you, Rachel, for that prompt. And as Chip mentioned earlier, really a big part of our charge as park staff in these planning efforts uh, is to protect and enhance resources, natural ones being so critical in this ecosystem and at Coulter Bay specifically. And Chip said this, that, and it's true, and we incorporated into our planning that it's really foundational for all of these efforts to have um, sustainable and enhanced ecosystems moving forward. And more specifically, uh, wildlife and natural resource biologists, uh, myself being one of them, are on the team that are creating alternatives. And all of these park projects we do emphasize the need to protect these resources. Uh, and we, uh, how developed areas are not generally where we emphasize core habitat protection for larger wildlife. Uh, that said, sustaining native species, habitat, and a healthy environment is, um, again, always at the forefront. and. You know, one of the uh, examples of that is this area is adjacent to the uh, primary conservation area for grizzly bears. One of the reasons that we do have a fully occupied grizzly bear habitat. And so some of the uh, efforts uh, and criteria for that primary conservation area just across the street essentially um, are baked into this planning. and. Uh, also related to water and air quality, uh, the park is really committed to uh, improving and enhancing our sustainability efforts. Uh, one of the examples right in Coulter Bay is that we have moved from underground field storage to above ground field storage. Uh, we just, uh, uh, I think, finished and turned on uh, a couple of months ago a new pump station for uh, sewage to uh, some of the sewage treatment uh, facilities we have adjacent. And so all of that is an, an effort to uh, make sure that we're protecting and enhancing these resources. Okie doke. Thanks, Simeon. Uh, we have a question for Chip. I'm going to toss back that way with, um, there's a question about with the new facilities museum in the southern part of the park close to Jackson. Will there be plans to update and potentially expand the Coulter Bay Visitor Center as a museum to tell some different stories? Um, would this open up visitor experiences for travelers who are coming in from Dubois or heading to Yellowstone? So how are we kind of thinking about visitor context stations, visitor centers in the Coulter Bay area? Yeah, uh, I think we, uh, you know, as Jen, uh, so first of all, right, we're looking at data. And uh, as Jen pointed out, part of the data that we're seeing is um, currently about half of the day visitors uh, in the park may be coming in uh, visiting Coulter Bay. So that means, you know, people uh, people have a need for orientation, wayfinding, as well as also for um, a, a key part of what we want to be doing is telling the story of this ecosystem. We want to be informing people, uh, uh, teaching them and helping them learn about wildlife, about, um, uh, about the aquatic systems, about, um, about the, uh, uh, the importance of this ecosystem. And we need places in order to be able to do that. Uh, and I think, so we are, um, we are very, very interested in getting the feedback from you um, about uh, what that might look like. Um, what are, uh, what, uh, uh, as we consider, um, as we consider a changing world and moving forward, uh, uh, um, the idea of what a visitor center was in 1960 and meeting the needs of people, particularly in the day and age, 
when people have access to virtually unlimited information through devices like this, um, how is it that we are uh, creating uh, spaces that are uh, adaptable to changing um, changing needs of people in the future? So we welcome that. Uh, let me also say is um, I think people have asked questions about uh, um, uh, 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 Native American uh, culture and heritage. And as we've talked about, Coulter Bay has been a place where uh, humans have been on the landscape for thousands of years and where uh, the Park Service has worked in various ways to try to support uh, providing um, uh, uh, information about uh, tribal heritage and culture. Um, I think one of the things that we are very, very mindful of is um, it is what we really want to do is not um, tell the story for tribes. Rather, what we want to do is we want to create the opportunity and the space for allowing, uh, for enabling tribes uh, to be able to tell their own stories or to work with us to uh, help us understand how they want their cultures represented. And so um, I just want to caution people from saying uh, things about uh, you ought to do this to, to tell about tribal story or you ought to do that, but rather how is it that we create the, the both the um, physical space as well as also the psychological space for us to be able to work um, hand in hand with tribes to be able to uh, appropriately represent their culture in the ways that they want it represented, not the way we think it ought to be represented. Thanks. Great, thank you so much for that, Chip. Uh, and I see that our questions are winding down, but we do have one more that I am gonna ask uh, Jen to start off on and then invite others if they wanna weigh in um, on it. But Jen, kick us off on this one. Um, some folks have noticed that some places in Teton have become a little bit crowded, maybe like Jenny Lake, um, and that they're thinking about how could we avoid Coulter Bay becoming another Jenny Lake? What are your thoughts? Yeah, great. Thank you, Rachel. Um, yeah, I think really what is helpful for us is to understand what are those things that we want to avoid in those places or spaces um, within the park that you're you're comparing Coulter Bay to. Like, what about those places um, might make you want to avoid them or, or might be a reason why you don't go there? Like, tell us what those are um, and so we can incorporate that into our planning efforts and also let us know there's, there seems to be a juxtaposition here that Coulter Bay isn't like some of these places. So really, um, if folks could help us and articulate what it is about Coulter Bay currently that makes that place different or special um, within the park, we really want to hear that and, and really understand that um, so we can continue to preserve that um, as we move into the future. I think that would be really helpful for us to understand um, and, and keep that wonderful link there in Pepsi and provide those comments for us so we can include it as we move forward. Okay, thanks. Um, I think we have gotten to all of the different themes that we heard questions on. So I am just going to do a quick reminder for folks um, on the comment period. Um, we are in an active comment period, so if you have thoughts, feedback, ideas for us to be considered, um, this is the um, page that you are looking for. Um, this is a screenshot of what our park planning environment and public comment site looks like. You're looking for this green comment now button, um, and that's going to take you to the comment form. Um, that you're looking for. Uh, and this is kind of where you're going to be looking when you get to that QR code or into that URL. You're looking for the open comment or the comment now button to find that screen. And just wanted to um, remind folks that um, we're excited and really looking forward to reading your comments. Uh, my favorite thing to remind folks on uh, these meetings are that uh, while we do try to leverage best available technology at all times, um, as the National Park Service, we are not so advanced that we have any kind of fancy AI that does any of these common analysis things. It's someone who you've met tonight on this meeting who is going to be reading your comments 
going through all of those letters. So the time that you are investing in putting comments together um, to share with us is time that we invest um, into reviewing those comments and integrating those ideas into our next steps. So we appreciate the time, energy, and thoughtfulness um, that you put in putting a letter together um, when you send it to us. So a reminder that that comment period is open through January 11th um, to get your comments in. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over to our superintendent, Chip Jenkins, for any closing thoughts. Chip? Again, yep. Uh, thanks, Rachel. Thanks, everybody, for the park team in terms of doing this. And thank you so much for everybody who tuned in. And I do want to say, I like we we really really appreciate your questions and uh, that you will take time uh, to be able to see about uh, considering providing uh, input. We also really hope that you will tell family, friends, people that you uh, know who are interested in the future of Grand Teton about this planning effort and to be able to spread the word. Um, this is the first of what will be many opportunities for people to be able to uh, help uh, uh, where we will share uh, what, what our thinking is, how we've taken your feedback, and uh, how we move along. And, uh, and central to all of this is how are we uh, uh, Collectively, how are we all, uh, visitors, residents in the community, Park Service employees, volunteers, uh, private business, um, the local communities, how is it that we all need to be working together as stewards of this place so that we can continue the 100 year uh, long legacy of um, working to preserve and to enhance and to restore this going into the future? So thank you for your time. And we look forward to continuing the work together.